of a walk up here. I tell you, there's a lot of steps to climb here. But the view, wow, now that is spectacular. That has to be a priceless view. In fact, so much so that China used it as the inspiration for their 20 yuan notes. Hopefully you can see there how similar they are. China is vast. It's got the greatest mountain range, the Himalayas, the highest plateau, more caves than any other country, and three of the longest rivers to be found on Earth. In this series, I'm going to search out some of China's furthest corners. This is a little bit dicey going in here. Discovering the unexpected and thrilling life that's to be found here. I think this is your snow leopard. Oh, look at that look one. Look at that yes. one. On the trail of the unique animals, landscapes, and people of wild China. Hey! This is one of China's most famous landscapes. This is a great bird's eye view of the world. And it's my starting point for exploring life above and below ground, along the Li River in Guangxi province in South China. These extraordinary hills are called castes, and the reason for their existence is this, limestone. Now, the thing about limestone is that when rain falls out of the atmosphere, it takes some carbon dioxide with it and becomes slightly acidic. You get carbonic acid. And the acid acting on the limestone eats into it. Now, of course, there's rain. But here, you have monsoon rains. So you get a much stronger action. The rain cuts even faster through the limestone. And what you're left with is this wonderful landscape. It's a landscape that covers almost half a million square kilometers of southern China. The steep hills and thick jungle make it a difficult place to explore on foot. So I'm heading down to the river. This whole landscape was sculpted by the relentless action of water. So what better way to explore it than to get down on the water itself? Ni hao. They call this the land of the dragon. And I can just imagine one circling around the pinnacle of one of those casts. Wouldn't that be amazing? Many of these casts have got legends and fairy tales associated with them. It's hardly surprising, it's a mysterious landscape. And they've also got wonderful names like Golden Tile Hill and uh, Penholder Hill, Carp Hill, or Green Lotus Peak. That's really evocative. It's a magical place. That's a water buffalo there. Very distinctive, the small head, big body. They're an interesting animal. They're superbly well adapted for life in marshy wetland areas. In summer, they'll spend most of their day submerged in muddy water to get away from biting insects. Their extra wide hooves stop them sinking into the wet ground, and they'll use their backward sweeping horns to shovel extra mud over themselves. They've been perhaps the single most important beast of burden in this part of the world, enabling people to pull plows and to, to plow the paddy fields so they're a very important uh, animal in China, historically. And they're very beautiful animals, too. When you look at them from a distance, you think, oh, it's just a dark cow. But when you actually have a closer look, they've got a little bit more personality than that. The raft that I'm on is quite interesting. It's made from plastic irrigation pipes. 
but it's modelled exactly on the technology that came before it, was using bamboo. And bamboo is everywhere along the river. <laughs> Fisherman Huang Nengdi certainly looks the part. I'm very impressed with your raft. This is a very good raft. It is small, which is good for fishing with cormorants on this river. Nengdi has hand reared his cormorants and trained them to hunt fish for him. Cormorants have elastic throats that can expand to swallow large fish. That's amazing. In this fishing tradition, a string is tied loosely around the bird's necks so that they can swallow tiddlers but have to regurgitate large fish. Now, I understand that um, today you can make a very good living for part of the year by demonstrating these traditional techniques for tourists, but you still actually really use them, don't you? So usually we go fishing at night. During the day we take pictures with tourists. I'm going to show you how to cast the net and then how to get a cormorant to catch a fish. OK, let's have a look and see how it all works. getting a demonstration here of his different fishing methods. <laughs> I love this. And this is cast fishing. It's a very effective way to fish in shallow waters. It's used widely throughout the world. There's a real skill to Nengdi's technique. <laughs> Amazing. But the stars of the show are his cormorants. So the river is very cold today and you wouldn't use this method in these conditions because the, the fish just are not active. So he's got some fish and he's throwing them in to demonstrate how it works. There goes the fish. And you see how they try to swallow the fish head first. But because of the restraint, they can't swallow it. That's a cunning way to go fishing. <laughs> the size of that fish. Now, the cormorant is an incredible bird when it comes to fishing. It's got unique characteristics. Unusually, for a water bird, its feathers aren't waterproof. They actually get wet. And that enables it to dive. In fact, the birds even swallow stones as ballast to give them a better chance to get down deep. And the way their bodies are designed, to be sleek, slim, with very powerful webbed feet at the back, enables them to travel very, very quickly. And they're fast with their bill. And if you look at the end of their bill, it's got a curve. So that if they snatch a fish, it can't get away because it's got the hook on the end of its bill that prevents that. You see the speed at which they move, it's astonishing. The birds are rewarded as Nengdi swaps the big fish for smaller ones that they can swallow. It may look like he's being rough with the birds, but he's not. You have to be very bold with them, otherwise they peck you. And um, he's already told me that he has to recognize the different calls the birds make. They tell him whether they're hungry, whether they're tired, whether they're cold, and he has to respond. It's a much tighter relationship that the fisherman has with the birds than meets the eye at a casual glance. You see him give a little jump on the raft, and that's to G the birds up and let them know that he's about to, to uh, set them off.
capture is actually very skillful. I've fallen out of a canoe more than once when I've been fishing and I'm sat down, he's standing up when there's all that going on and you've got birds around you. <laughs> I bet he's fallen off occasionally. <laughs> Just amazing. <laughs> I've enjoyed the unique life I've seen along this river, but an even more extraordinary sight awaits me where I'm heading next, below ground. I'm exploring South China's karst landscape. And as you can see, I've discovered it's as beautiful underground as it is above. This is China's Seven Star Cave, a wonder of the natural world. These caves have long held people under their spell. In fact, there's evidence for people visiting caves in this region for at least 10,000 years. All these chambers were created by ancient underground rivers, eating away at the soft limestone rock. Look at that perfect reflection. I think show caves like this are wonderful. They're a real celebration of nature's own sculpture. But you know, what I want to do is to get a little bit more off of the beaten track. China has more caves than any other country in the world. Many of the casts along the Li River contain vast underground chambers. I'm heading off to explore one of them in the company of expert caver and cast scientist, Dr. Alice Hughes, and her research team from China's Academy of Sciences. So what are you finding on the casts? Well, casts are absolutely unique systems. Every single hill can have unique species found nowhere else in the world. So every single one of them is unique. So each one of these is like an island in a sea of humanity. I mean, I've never seen this landscape before and it's given me two very strong impressions. The firstly is of concentration mm -hmm. because you have the concentration of the habitat of the cast itself but also the concentration of human life because yeah. there's not much flat ground here and it, every, every centimetre is being utilised. Absolutely. The other thought I had was I felt like an ant walking across a great chessboard and these castle like chess pieces. This morning I looked out and there was very, very heavy mist and three of the casts that I'd been looking at the day before, I couldn't see. It's like someone had come and moved them. I feel, really felt like I was on a chessboard. Amazing landscape. And the cast landscape really is at risk of disappearing because the limestone hills are mined for cement making. The rate of mining across this region means that that cast might actually not be there in a few decades or even shorter time spans. And when that cast is gone, all the species on it is gone too. Then it's about finding a balance. So how do we say mine part of a cast while maintaining the species on it? Alice and her researcher, Chao Huwei, are taking me to a cave known to the locals as Moonwater Cave where the underground chambers extend from one side of the cast to the other. OK, we're here, so helmets and lights on. There we go. It looks quite man-made. That's right. This used to be a tourist cave, and no, it's not used anymore. Despite its reputation for stunning scenery, the difficult underground passages discouraged tourists. Ready to go? Yes, let's, uh, let's, go let's descend. Today it's abandoned and very few people know how to navigate it safely. Well, it's pretty dramatic, isn't it? Yep. Our route begins with a steep descent into the depths surrounded by distinctive stalactites and stalagmites.
And although this might look as if nothing's living here, there's actually plenty of life if you know where to find it. Our cave is rather like a, the coastline that you get different sorts of creatures at different depths within them. Absolutely. There could be some bats, but you'll also see cave crickets. And then in sometimes near the entrances of caves, you'll have various snake species. So keep your eyes open. As we move away from the entrance chamber, it becomes pitch black. Creatures here have adapted to life in the dark. So if we have a look around in a dry habitat like this, we might see some cave crickets. I think there's one there. Oh, yeah. And these crickets have got very long antennas. Are they using that more than their eyes? Pretty much. In a low light uh, condition, you need to be able to find other ways of finding your way around. So by feeling around with their antennas, they can see if there are gaps they can go through. I mean, they're delicate. They look vulnerable as well. They are, but like most parts of an insect, they can be regrown. Regrowing missing limbs, like legs or antennae, is a useful survival skill for these crickets. Oh, there he goes. He's gone out of the light. He wants the shadows. OK. We're going further in. Yep, let's go. This is where the concrete walkway ends. There's just a muddy labyrinth of tunnels ahead. Even with the guide ropes, I'm glad I've got Alice leading the way. This is not a place to go exploring on your own. The cave walls are speckled with ancient fossils, over a hundred million years old. Look at that, incredible. To think how old these things are, these evidence of life from former times, I think it's just staggering. It makes me feel really small and insignificant in the scheme of things. Ah, oh, look at that. That's amazing. Looks like a living tree. Over millions of years, water drops from the limestone ceilings have created these impressive rock formations. Saw something moving down there. Look. Got some more crickets here, Alice. Have you got anything over there? Oh, yeah, there's a millipede in here. Let's have a look. Oh, it's tiny. And just like the cave crickets, completely depigmented. There's no reason for colourful markings for camouflage or to attract a mate because nothing can see them in the dark. And watch your head as you come through. In the heart of the cast, the cave closes in. These are tight squeezes and uncomfortably claustrophobic spaces. It's very tight in here. But when I can stand up again, oh, what a sight. Stunning, isn't it? Chao Hu Wei explains how this impressive rock pillar was formed. Here the cave is very big. This means it has been eroding for a long time and is very old. Water droplets from the ceiling and sediment on the floor have built up to form a thin pillar. So this is where a stalactite and a stalagmite have met. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's one of the most amazing sculptures that you see in nature. It reminds me of uh, some wild honeycomb. In the monsoon season, after heavy rain, caves like this become impassable. You certainly wouldn't want to be exploring here if there's been rain in the district or neighbouring district. But today, the water is limited to a shallow trickle. Now, the only way out is 
to literally walk up the stream. Quite looking forward to seeing daylight again, but it is fascinating to be here. I had no idea there was so much life living in these dark places. Quite astonishing. Do you know, it's actually quite refreshing to get my feet in the water. It's been slippery and muddy elsewhere. Now I feel this firmer footing. The stream takes us to an almost vertical shaft, our route out of the cave system. Finally, light at the end of the tunnel. Well, that was wonderful. Great to see how much life there is down there inside the heart of one of these cast hills. This is a place where I feel I've glimpsed our shared past. It's an ancient place, and still much of it is undiscovered. And out here, it's really calm and peaceful. It's lovely. A truly magical corner of wild China. Next time, I'm tracking across China's high grasslands on a bear hunt. This is a little bit dicey going in here. Enjoying some traditional hospitality and surprise encounters. Uh, they're big boys.